Thank you guys for coming. It's so cold. Holy mackerel. Welcome. Wow. Um, well, as he said, I'm here to talk about fever. And I have a little different perspective. Um, I know this is the most, okay, this is the most beautiful facility I've ever seen. And I know you have like a lot of professionals like biologists and stuff like that. I'm not a professional biologist and I don't have an educational background in wildlife and stuff like that. I'm actually a hairdresser, <laughs> okay? And the reason I like to explain that to people and tell people about that is because if I can get involved and make a difference, anybody can, okay? I'm not your outdoorsy person. I'm a hairdresser. I don't camp out. I believe in Bigfoot. I, I like HBO and soft beds, okay? And um, I'm just not your regular, you know. Um, but the way that I got involved, I, I grew up in Colorado, and I've always loved animals. I love animals. But the animals that I, I that really like flipped my switch, so to speak, were like coyotes and mountain lions and and wolves and stuff like that, not beaver. The only thing I knew about beaver was that they had flat tails and made dams. That's about as far as it went. <coughs> and one day I was scrubbing my floor in Capitol Hill, and there was a story on TV how these beaver were gonna be killed for taking down trees on a golf course in Aurora. And I'm scrubbing away and I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go again. These animals are going to be killed for doing what th I guess they do. The Division of Wildlife said they had to be killed. There was no place to put them. So I thought maybe I could find a place to put them. The Division of Wildlife would move them there. That would be that. I'd feel warm and fuzzy. I saved some animals. The first place I called was Rocky Mountain National Park. They said, we'll take some beaver so you know. I call the Division of Wildlife. And you know, if you call your friend, he's gonna be excited because you're excited. I call the Division of Wildlife, they weren't really excited. Um, I said, hey, I found a place to put the beaver. And he said, where? And I said, Rocky Mountain National Park. He said, do you know how much money that'll cost? I said, five bucks for gas. Gas was a lot cheaper back then too. And I said, well, I'll do it. And he didn't say I couldn't do it. I think he was kind of shocked, okay? So then I called the city of Aurora. The city of Aurora was really happy to hear from me, and they gave me the name of the trapper. And I called the trapper, and I said, hey, man, if you live trap the beaver, I'll move them. I can, I can take them up to Rocky Mountain National Park. He said, you can't live trap beaver. I, he said, every time I've tried, they've drowned. And I said, well, I read about it in National Geographic. I saw the picture. I know you can live trap beaver. Well, I'll do it. Okay, now the media is picking up on it. And I was a lot younger than this was back in 1985. I was real thin, had fluffy hair and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, so I found out the Colorado Division of Wildlife had the traps I needed. So I went to the Division of Wildlife to borrow their traps. Now I'm not a dumb hairdresser, so I took the media with me. So they'd look like jerks if they didn't let me use their traps. <laughs> I asked this guy, I said, I want to borrow a couple traps. He brings them out, and they were in big boxes. They were live traps, okay? They were live in the boxes. And I'm trying to be cool because I'm a hairdresser. And I, I looked down at the traps, and I said, you know, could you run through this with me? He said, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and I did. I did. You know why? Because I'm a woman and not a man, and I didn't throw away the instructions that came with the traps. <laughs> Actually, I, sa <laughs> I sat on my front yard in Capitol Hill, and I cried. But <laughs> there was a lot of pressure because the TV stations were calling me. The newspaper was calling me. <laughs> Everybody was calling me, and I had to move some beaver. So I went through the instructions with the trap, one step by two step by three step, and I figured it out. The first night out, I caught two beaver. That was the most exciting thing I have ever done in my life. It was more fun. Oh, my God. Okay. So, moved them up to Rocky Mountain National Park. And you know a lot of times when you're involved with the environmental stuff and 
wildlife and stuff, you get to not liking people very much because you see a lot of bad things. Okay, well, what was really cool was I started getting all kinds of phone calls from folks who had beaver and were having problems and wanted the animals moved. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? So that, I'm going, that, that, that's a good thing. Okay, so I'm moving these animals. And like I said, I didn't know a thing about beaver. And the more I started handling them, remember, I'm a hairdresser, not a biologist. I get up close and friendly with animals. I kiss snakes and lizards. I mean, kiss? Oh, yes. Tree hugger? Here I am. Went to Zion National Park, became a rock kisser. Okay? <laughs> I, I just love stuff, okay? <clears throat> and um, these animals were so weird. I was messing around with fox and coyotes and, and, and stuff, even mountain lions, you know? And um, beaver were different. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on about them. And you know what I found out? We really shouldn't be moving them at all. We should be learning to coexist with them because in fact, of all the wildlife, they're probably the most important wildlife species we have. We don't think of them in that way, but I'm hoping to change your mind and show you how that's true. Okay, now my slideshow, I start from the very beginning when I knew nothing about beaver and what I learned about them. Maybe these things, you know some of it, but that's okay. It'll refresh your memory, and I, I hope you enjoy my slide presentation, okay, from a hairdresser. And remember, I'm kind of blunt sometimes. Don't want to offend anybody, but I hope you have fun. Let's start. <laughs> yeah. We need the lights down, low as you can get them. I'm not a photographer either. I've kind of learned to do all kinds of stuff. Oh, you know what? I'm used to Chris doing this. Beaver, Castor canadensis. When you think of beaver, you normally think of this big flat tail. Now I go to a lot of schools and kids will tell me, beaver build their dams with that tail. They pat their mud with that tail. No, they don't. They use that tail like the rudder on a boat going through the water. They flap it for short bursts of speed. Okay, and they'll flip it underneath them and use it for balance, I always say, when they're taking down the city's trees, okay? <coughs> Beaver, one of the only animals I know in North America that will walk upright and carry their kits in their arms. They will also walk up the side of their dam or lodge carrying mud and sticks in their arms. Isn't that cool? When we think of beaver, we normally think of beaver in this brownish color kind of brownish red color. Before Europeans um, trapped beaver almost into extinction, Chris, get up here. I don't like doing this. I want you to do it. I need to say okay, see, because I know I'm going to fall off here and break my neck. I'm not used to that. Okay. We normally think of beaver coming in that color. Before Europeans trapped them almost to extinction, beaver came in all colors, just like, just like us. They were black beaver in the Great Lakes. They were so black that in the sunlight they were blue. There was white beaver in Yellowstone. We had red beaver, silver beaver, blonde, all colors of beaver, okay? This is probably going on a two-year-old, all right? Beaver, they come in kits, sub-adults, and, and adults, and when they become two years old, two year olds, they mate. Next slide. Oh yeah, in, in 27 years of live trapping, this is the only blonde beaver that I've caught. Do you know that before Europeans almost trapped beaver into extinction, there were between 60 to 400 million beaver on the continent. Their range was from the Arctic Circle to the northern part of Mexico. Isn't that amazing? I just, that blows me away. This is a para beaver. One thing I learned is when you live trap beaver, or live trap anything, it's your responsibility to know everything you can about that animal before you start messing with it. So what you do to it disrupts their life as little as possible. Okay, I found out that beaver mate for life and they're monogamous. So what we do is, and they keep their babies with them for two years. So when we live trap, we always do our best to get the whole family and move them together. We do not separate families. This is a pretty good sized beaver. The average weight of a beaver is about 45 pounds maybe. The largest beaver I caught 
was 67. And I never trap by myself because I'm, I'm afraid of water. Unless I'm live trapping, <laughs> and unless I'm live trapping beaver, isn't that weird? If I'm live tra if I'm live trapping, I'll get right in the water. I, I don't know, but otherwise I'm afraid of water. I, it's like a strange thing, and and I was trapping. I had to check traps by myself. Now there had been some really hellacious water going down through Clear Creek, and the place I had the the trap set. It, the water was so deep it was over my head, so there was no way I could get underneath the trap and push it up. And it was a deep, a steep bank, and the trap was down a bank, and I might as well have been trying to move a Volkswagen. I could not budge that trap, okay? And I was hot, and I was tired, and I was all by myself. And finally, this little man comes down the bicycle path, and I said, mister, would you please help me put my beaver in the car? He said, what? <laughs> But that beaver weighed 67 pounds. Next slide. Next slide. Beaver are vegetarians. Now, you folks probably know that, okay? But a lot of people don't. I get a lot of calls from landowners and stuff saying, you got to get rid of these beaver. They're going to eat my fish. <coughs> they don't eat fish. They're vegetarians. The trees they prefer actually oftentimes benefit from the pruning action of their teeth. They're like members of the poplar family, aspen, willows, cottonwood. They like, um, they like fruit trees, okay? The thing is, and I get excited, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, okay. Beaver take down trees mostly in the spring and in the fall. Once they have their dams and lodges finished, their tree felling activity slows down substantially. They still have to take down trees because their teeth always grow. Like the beaver themselves. Beaver always grow. Their teeth always grow. So they have to take down trees to get their teeth, you know, beveled down. Okay? And um, so when they have their, their dams and lodges completed, they'll start eating a lot of grasses, sedges, algae, and, and stuff like that. Anyway, it will slow down. They just don't take trees, take trees, take trees. Next slide. You know, oh yeah, I was taking this picture down while I was at the Platte River. I'm lying. This was in Canada. One of the things that's interesting about my work with beaver is I probably learned as much about these animals or about humans as I did about these animals. One of the things I learned is we disrespect our waterways in a horrible way. When I first started live trapping down at the Platte River, I thought it was a place where tires went to die. One of these days, I'm going to catch a woman putting her dirty diapers in Bear Creek. I'm going to push her in the water. I have never in my life seen anything like it. We're going to end up drinking this stuff. This is terrible. But I learned so much about humans. This was taken in Canada, and wouldn't it be nice if our water was this clean? But look at this lovely animal. Look at them big web feet. They double up their little fist when they swim. And I do call them hands. They are not paws. They are hands. They've got fingers. They can eat a branch and turn it with their fingers just like eating a corn on a cob. It's like art. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. They're so delicate and so little teeny tiny branches and stuff like that. Next slide. <clears throat> This is your traditional lodge and dam. This was taken over in Craig, Colorado. Okay, you know, we see this a lot, but a lot of times we don't exactly know really what's happening. Beaver will pack mud around the outside of the lodge, but they leave the center <coughs> hollow for ventilation. You know, Chris and I, by the way, Chris Gosser, she's volunteered with me now for seven years. Say hello. Okay, we have broken into lodges trying to get one of the adults. We always do our best to get the whole family. And sometimes I'm not being, okay, when you live trap beaver, you generally catch the male and the youngsters. Not all the time, but you get usually the female last. And it's almost like she's the most wary. Beaver families are matriarchal, as it should be. Okay. Um, the female directs the dam and lodge building. The male acts as the protector. All right. But Chris and I, if we couldn't get one of the adults, we're good. Okay. We're just going to get you. Okay. Twice in my life, I've caught beaver by hand. 
Nobody should have that much fun. That was the most fun I have ever had. It was unbelievable. Okay, but you break into this lodge and you think it's kind of going to be funky. Clean as a pin. All you can smell is the earth. In fact, beaver smells so clean and so fresh. They, they smell like when you go to the mountains and you smell that willow, <coughs> real nice clean smell of willow. That's what they smell like. Their bodies, they're just so clean. They groom all the time. Anyway, next slide. This is another bank lodge, another way that beaver live. Now, recently they did a survey in Denver about the number one tourist attraction. Now, we've got places in Colorado that are so beautiful they'll bring tears to your eyes. But that survey said, you're not going to believe this, that Cherry Creek Mall was the number one tourist attraction. Well, this beaver dam, or lodge, sorry, is right across from Cherry Creek Mall. So there is something good about it, I guess. Next slide. This is your bank den. Beaver will live here before they hook up with a mate and build a larger lodge. But even though beaver build a lodge and they're a mated pair, they always have little cubby holes to hide in the land. Okay, that when they're out underneath the ice feeding in the winter and they've built up that food cache, they'll go out to pick up limbs and things and they will then go into one of those holes to eat it and stuff. Next slide. This is also, there's a beaver lodge right here. And these are some trees that looks like a little out of focus. I can't see anything. I know, but maybe somebody back there can. It's just a little out of focus. Please. Great. You know, they can. Um, this is a place called Overland Pond Educational Park. And the Colorado Division of Wildlife stocks this with fish. It's right at Evans and Federal. I mean, sorry, Santa Fe and Federal. And I would get a call from, the, uh, from Denver Parks and Recreation. The, the beaver, they're taking down our trees. Oh, my God, you've got to get them out of here. And this does look kind of, kind of funky. Okay, and this was like a long time ago before I got into just wrap the doggone trees. But I'm going out there and I'm going to catch the beaver. I'm looking around. Next slide. This is what the people do. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could relocate those people? I don't know where we'd put them. But a lot of times, you know what I think city officials do? Humans do this, but there's nothing they seem to be able to do about it, so they focus on the beaver. Oh, the beaver taking down the trees. Look at this. Isn't this terrible? Well, look at what the doggone humans are doing. You know, it's like focusing people's attention away from the real problem because the beaver taking down trees are part of natural processes. All you got to do is wrap the trees you find aesthetically valuable, let the beaver have the younger trees, and you can have wildlife and trees. Next slide. <coughs> This is the beaver that I caught out of that pond. I know it's not cool. Well, um, people like sometimes don't like to name animals. And I'm from the 60s. I only name those animals I can really connect with. I named him Cousteau, and I put him in Rocky Mountain National Park. Isn't he beautiful? You can't pick up all beaver, by the way. The first 150 beaver I caught, I picked up every one. Every one I picked up. Blows my mind today. <laughs> I don't do that anymore, but I used to, I picked up, well, the first 150, I picked up everybody. Isn't that something? Look at that, the nose, <coughs> the eye, and the ear on the top of the head. So when they swim, that's what you can see. When they dive, their little nose pinches shut. There's a membrane that goes over their eyes for protection, and that ear will pinch shut. Folks, you have never felt soft until you felt a beaver's ear. Mm -hmm. You've never felt, they got the softest ear you've ever felt. It's just amazing. There's also behind those beautiful orange teeth, they have a, a flap that goes behind the teeth so when they go out underneath the water, they can pick up sticks and limbs and things without the water going down their throat. Now this is, this is so interesting. See those claws? Don't they look brutal? Well, they're not. I don't know why this is this way. I've caught raccoon and had them reach out of a trap and really claw me till I bled and not much of a swipe. A beaver will grab you with their hands and not leave a mark. And they'll just dig their, they don't leave a mark. And I, don't, I, I guess it's because they dig in the, the soil and stuff. The only thing you have to be careful about a beaver is their teeth. 
all right? And a beaver, usually before they bite you, will try to push you down or hit you with their shoulder. Isn't that, that they're so cute. And they, they've got uh, big web feet, and the, the second toe on the inside is a double claw. Now, being a cosmetologist, I thought the beaver had injured their, claw, injured their toenail and was growing a new toenail. But in fact, I read that they use that toenail as a comb, which they use all the time to distribute the oils throughout their body. Maybe that's one of the things that make them smell so good, and it makes them waterproof. And they also use it to pick splinters out of their teeth. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Okay, next slide. And I just had to put that in here because I love the look on his face. Isn't that the cutest damn thing? Now look at that, look at those tones. Isn't that something? And they'll just grab you with them. You know, when we used to relocate beaver up in Rocky Mountain National Park, we'd go into the visitor center and we'd put the beaver on the floor. And it was during a time there's all kinds of people around. <coughs> and everybody just loved the beaver and they're petting them and stuff. And um, I, the, the biologist came out and he said, well, we got to get up to the mountain, okay? And I picked this, I picked this beaver up. I named him Otis. And uh, this lady come over to me, and she said, well, could I hold him? I said, sure. And I handed her Otis. And she goes, oh, my God, I'll never forget this. This is one of the greatest experiences of my life. I said, oh, and I know it's wonderful. I better go. And I got him, and he peed all over her. <laughs> and she, she looks at her shirt. She goes, I'll never wash this. <laughs> But look at that face. Isn't that the most amazing animal? You know, so often we always think people will say, oh, but the beaver are killing my trees. Well, the problem is, is people are moving to the mountains and they got what I call the dreaded golf course mentality. They want a tree here, a bush here, some flowers here. They don't want it to change. In fact, the only thing constant in nature is change. It changes, it ebbs, it floods, it, you know. It moves all the time. You don't want things in a static state. So people call me all the time about beaver taking tree, down trees. There's really easy ways to solve that just by wrapping them. Anyway, but I just, anyway, next slide. I, when I was young, I used to trap in a bikini. Everybody loved to see me coming. Um, this is the trapper that called me, that, that said he didn't know how to live trap beaver, and he called me in 1989, and he said, would you teach me how? I said, sure. His name was Perry. Now, this is the Hancock Live Beaver Trap. All right. What we do is, then we were using apples. In fact, sometimes I'd use five apples. Put them all in the middle there. I don't use a lot of apples anymore because all wildlife like apples. And when beaver get in these traps, they have a tendency to eat everything. And if a beaver eats five apples, they get really bad gas. And I only had a little bitty car. I used to drive down the street and my eyes would be watering. But, so we don't use a lot of apples anymore. But the, the, the whole thing is, is the beaver would come swimming around here and, and eat the apples and smell the lure. We use traditional beaver lure like a trapper, okay? And step on the pan, okay? The bottom of the trap comes up out of the water and catches the beaver against the bank. In 27 years of live trapping, I've lost two adult beaver because of flash flooding. You know why? Because for some reason, people want to take the curves out of creeks. Instead of meandering, they want to straighten them out, which causes the water to rush down the creek. And where we were setting traps, it hardly was raining at all. But up the creek, it rained really hard and it caused a flood. Now if it rains, I will not set traps. I'm very, very careful if it's gonna rain hard at all. I have gone out at 11.30 at night across town in, when I was in bed, okay, and read across the bottom of the screen, flash flood warnings in Sand Creek. I call my volunteer, Steve Reddy. I said, we're getting out there. We pulled traps, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, had a little bitty pin light pulling them traps and caught a beaver. The beaver would have died, but I will not lose another beaver. Okay, we've got the best record, a hairdresser. Isn't that a trip, man? Can you believe that? Of anybody in not just the United States, the world. I recently worked with the country of Norway. They put out a publication on beaver management, and I did the chapter on live trapping and relocating. I'm very proud of that. Can't read a word of it, but I'm really proud. Okay, the thing here is there's all kinds of reasons 
that people want be removed. In the case of Evergreen, this is where Evergreen gets their water supply, okay, is Evergreen Lake. And they were concerned that the beaver were going to cause <coughs> Giardia. We all know what Giardia is. A lot of people know it as beaver <coughs> fever. That's because the scientists that were studying it were out and about as soon as they saw beaver. That's it. Done deal. Beaver fever. Wrong. Beaver get Giardia from humans, and then they become carriers of it. From our irresponsible bad habits when we go hunting, hiking, fishing, recreating, and then they become carriers of it. Beaver have a relatively low rate of Giardia compared to muskrats and wading birds like herons and egrets. Okay? And also, calves and lambs have a much higher rate of Giardia than beaver. You can find Giardia cysts on about 95% of the daycare centers. And if you don't want to get Giardia, wash your hands. Real simple. But beaver get blamed for it. Check it out. We used to go up there and set traps, and for some reason, I wish I would have gotten a picture of this, there would be people standing all along this bank fishing. If you went to the west, there were public restroom facilities. If you went to the east, there'd be this place here where the beaver not only lived, but where birds nested. You know what we found there? All those jerks were going to the bathroom here instead of going to the public restroom facilities. That's where the beaver were going to carry have Giardia. But the, the other thing is, is you know, if the beaver had Giardia, they had a heck of a lot more muskrat in there than beaver. All the muskrats are going to have Giardia. Every deer that drinks out of that is going to have Giardia. People need to get a grip. I, I go to schools and I tell children, you know, you grow up and people tell you, we're the smartest species. I say, I'm here today to tell you it's not true. We're not so smart. We do the craziest thing. Anyway, this whole time we were trapping, this trapper was saying, oh, I killed thousands of raccoon. I killed thousands of bobcats, and I killed blah, blah, blah. You know, it doesn't take brains to kill anything. Next slide. He didn't know that you could pick up most beaver. <coughs> look at the look on his face. And you know how trappers love to say people like, well, you just anthropomorphize. You give them human, human habits or human characteristics. Let me tell you, I caught the whole family, all right, except for the female. And I had one in the bathtub at home, okay, because I didn't have any, and he was just in the bathtub, and we had, we caught one of the adults, we, or one of the yearlings, I guess, and brought it home, had it in a trap, and I wanted this beaver in the bathtub to see, we got your family member. Check it out, man. And took the beaver in the bathtub, and the beaver in the bathtub goes, and the beaver in the trap goes, the trapper goes, stop, I think they're talking. <laughs> in that a trip? And anyway, so he didn't know that you could pick up most beaver. And remember me talking about how good beaver smell? Okay, we couldn't catch the female. So I thought if I could get some of the urine from the kit, okay, I would put it on the trap and get the mama. It's real easy to get a beaver to pee. You just kind of lift them up and they pee in a, in a, they peed in a bowl. I drew it up in a syringe. There was a woman from the Canyon Courier, and she was doing a story. We were out getting it late at night, and it was getting dark. My volunteer was setting the trap, and I was getting ready to put the, the urine on the trap. And she's asking me questions. She kind of stopped, and I'm waiting. And I took the syringe, and I put it a little bit on my wrist, and... I'm just smelling it because when it's a little bit, it smells really good. Okay, and she goes, well, what is that? And I said, well, here, and I put some on her. She goes, oh, that's wonderful. What is that? <laughs> Next slide. <coughs> One of the things really cool about what we do, okay, very, very lucky, is all kinds of, it's out of focus, please. Um, all kinds of people that that want to be involved with wildlife but aren't interested in killing them can come with us and catch animals alive and not hurt them. This guy here sacked groceries at King Supers. We used to go in there when I was using all those apples and, he, and buy apples and he goes, what are you guys, health freaks? And I said, no, we live trap beaver. He goes, no, you don't. I said, yeah, you want to come with us? And here he is setting a trap down at the Platte River. Next slide. 
caught a beaver. Can you imagine the next day he goes to work? What'd you do last night, man? I went out catching beaver. Yeah, right. <laughs> next slide. This is a well-set trap. This is what a well-set trap looks like. This is what so many people that are the so-called traditional trappers don't seem to be able to do. I don't know why. Um, you notice that there's nothing in the back of the trap. You know why? Because the beaver ate everything. When I first started live trapping and the trappers didn't want me to do this, okay, they said, you can't use those traps. The beaver will break their, their teeth off in these traps and you'll turn them loose and they'll starve to death. Isn't that crazy? I said, well, they die in your traps, you know? But the beaver do really well in these traps. They do so well, <coughs> if an animal's under any kind of stress, they do not eat. And the beaver eat everything. Now, the only place we will move beaver from are urban areas, okay? In the cities. <coughs> um, when people call me and they live in the mountains, I'm not <coughs> going to move be beaver for people that live in the mountains because we need to learn to coexist with the wildlife up here. The wildlife have no place else to go. So we're real good at camouflaging our traps. The other thing is, is when we set traps, we set them about 3 in the afternoon. We pull them every morning. We never leave a beaver in the trap ever, not one time ever. I was teaching a class in New Mexico for the fish and game there and talking about how we set traps and why it's important to check your traps. And this guy, he said, well, we're just too busy to do that. You know, we can't get back there for two or three days. I said, unless you get in a car wreck and you die, you check your traps. Because the beaver don't ask to be there. So it's your responsibility to be, to care for these animals. Anyway, next slide. Sometimes we get two beaver in a trap. One time I caught three kids and an adult. And the interesting thing is, is the little kids are most often with their father. Can you focus that, please? Only one time in 27 years, I've caught the babies with the mother. Remember I said it's a matriarchal family? Four to 14 days after the kids are born, they start eating little tender shoots and leaves brought to them most often by their father. Isn't that cool? Um, and when they have the kids, they stay with them for two years, and the whole family participate in the caring of the babies. I just think that is so cool. Next slide. One time I caught three geese. <laughs> Their mother was so mad at me. And, and that they liked the apples, and that's when I really stopped using apples. Next slide. One time I caught two adults. Nobody was hurt. Isn't that cool? Next slide. Caught a raccoon. You have to be real fast if you want to love them. They will nail you. Next slide. <laughs> this is another thing that's so interesting. These kids went with me. You're going to have to stay up there because it's so out of focus, sweetie. Um, this was, a, you can say it's kind of cloudy. This is about a mile from where I live. And the week before, I'd caught three kids. And went back a few days later, we caught the rest of the family. And the important thing here to know is this guy here was just using the bicycle path. And he was so angry because we were taking these beaver out. Even though the city had called me and said, you got to get rid of the beaver, the people are complaining that the beaver had taken down the vegetation. What I realized was, is that most people like the animals, <coughs> but they just don't call and say thank you we appreciate them. It's so normal to call if you have a complaint. And so the cities are getting an imbalanced view of people's likes and dislikes concerning our urban wildlife. So I tell kids all the time, if you like the animals, call and say thank you. Because the cities really do get an imbalanced view. Anyway, one of the things that's so interesting about beaver with all fur bears is they breed according to the availability of, home, of, of, of food. If there's an abundance of food, they will have larger litters. When there's not a lot of food, they'll have smaller litters. Sometimes trappers will tell you, well, you just got too many beaver. We're just going to kill a few. Just kill a few. 
What that does is, when you remove a few, that causes the age of first reproduction to go down, litter size to go up. So after the first year of trapping, you have more beaver than you would have if you would have left them alone. That's so important because trappers will tell you that. There's two ways of managing. They're the way that I talk about managing, doing it natural by controlling the availability of food and coexisting with the animals by using flow devices and wrapping trees. And then there's the way that the traditional managers talk about it of managing so you have an abundance to kill the following year. I think that I don't like that. I think that that's a, that's a bad thing. Um, anyway, I took the animals home. People will say these animals have no feelings, okay? Nothing could be further from the truth. Next slide, Chris. Took the beaver home, let the three beaver out of the, bat, out of the trap. They were all over their parents. <laughs> Even the big beavers sound like that. Next slide, let them out of the trap, went all over the backyard. <laughs> <clears throat> I'd read about it in uh, Beaver World by Enos Mills, about he was sitting on a rock and watched all these beaver in a line going up over this mountain. I thought, what's he smoking? I, did, I thought, you know, wow, I was really surprised to see that. They really do do that. Next slide. Got to be, oh, looking in the window. Had little beaver handprints all over the sliding glass doors. <coughs> Next slide. The beaver in the bathtub. <laughs> when I first started live trapping, the Division of Wildlife wasn't really hot for me to do this. And uh, I did have two traps, but I had no cages at all. And whenever we relocated beaver, we would literally carry them in our arms to wherever we were relocating them. Amazing. Like I said, the first 150 beaver, I picked up everybody. Next slide. <coughs> when we get home, put them in a cage. And um, they generally, you say, I know this sounds weird. You say, go on in there, baby, go on. When I live trap beaver, I tell them everything I'm doing and I tell them it's gonna be okay. When we've held beaver in the backyard, and it's not the best of situations, the cages aren't great, we give them plenty of food and water, but it's not great. I've never lost a beaver one time, not ever, not once. We need more hairdressers doing this, okay? <laughs> Next slide. We give them plenty of food and uh, we trim trees down at the Bear Creek, and I finally got, after 27 years, I finally got Denver Parks and Recreation permission. But we, <laughs> we don't charge them anything, so we're trimming their trees. We cover them up, keep them cool. That's the most important thing is to keep these animals cool. All right, and um, I keep them until I get the whole family, and then they're moved together. I don't start live trapping beaver until the middle of June. That's when the kits are out of the lodge. Okay, beaver mate January, February. They have their babies sometime in May. Next slide. This is really important. This is my old car bud. And we, we put ice on the, on the cages, poke three holes in them, and let the water slowly drip on the animals to keep them cool. So you keep them well ventilated and you keep them cool. We drive down the road, people used to say, what kind of dogs are those? <laughs> but the reason this is important is there was some, a, wild, a state wildlife um, agency, I don't know if it was in Utah or Idaho, that was relocating six beaver and killed four because they let them get too hot. Okay? Isn't that crazy? And remember, and I don't know what state it was, that they were relocating black-footed ferrets and they all died because they let them get too hot. Why can't, you know, you, we have to have empathy for these animals. Sometimes people want to be so standoffish. Oh, they're just a wild animal. No, man, they have feelings. They fear, they have joy, they have sorrow. I've seen it. They're closer to us than, than we're comfortable with, with realizing because it keeps us safe, I think, with the way that we treat them. Do you know what I mean? They really do. They're, they're amazing animals. We've never lost a beaver during relocating them, not one time, not ever. Next slide. 27 years ago when the Division of Wildlife said we had too many beaver, there were beaver all over the state. I'm still finding people in places that want them. These beaver are needed. This was a place years ago, back in 1986-87, that wanted fishing ponds, okay, so they could fish. It was a fishing club. 
They contacted the human engineer. She was gonna charge 20,000, you know that was a long time ago for just 20,000 bucks to build three doggone ponds. And they said no, they saw me on TV, they gave me a call. They said, could you bring us beaver? I said, yeah. Next slide, couple of beaver. Like, you want me to do what? And they look like that. I want you to notice the flexibility of the tail. Isn't that something? How flexible it is. Um, next slide. <coughs> Went back about three months later. This is what we found. They'd already started. Now this is, this is really, really interesting. If you take water here, a vial of water, and you take a vial of water there, and you set them on a table, the water here has less suspendable solids than the water here. When the beaver build a dam and slow down that water velocity, all those suspendable solids and pollutants and everything settle out behind the dam, which builds up the ground, raises the water table. So beaver improve water quality. Next slide. Here's the dam. The water here is fingering out over the land, reaching that plant life, promoting biodiversity. The amount of water that you see in their ponds, there's about three times that underneath the ground. Isn't that something? They can recharge the aquifers. Next slide. I went back a couple years later. Next slide. Look what the beaver did. There's their little lodge. So why do they build the dams? They build the dams to impound the water. Beaver are not very aggressive, as you can see. They need that water for protection and also to access food. Okay? When they raise, it's much easier to float trees back to the dam than it is to carry them, you know what I mean? So yeah, they raise that for protection. Beaver, don't, beaver are beautiful in the water. They're just like a little torpedo. But on land, I can catch a beaver, so you know they can't run real fast. Next slide. This is a good beaver habitat, a good riparian area. Next, you can see this human here, one of our volunteers. Next slide. This is a drag. Out of focus. You know what? I got here early today to find out my slide projector didn't work, so we had to borrow one. Isn't that amazing? <gasps> Heart attack. Anyway, so they will have like a specific place that they'll climb up and take aspens and drag them back to their pond. If you have any questions, anybody ask me. I don't want to forget anything. I always forget stuff. Next slide. They also <laughs> mark their territory. <coughs> you hear all the time about beaver living in colonies. I don't, I don't call them colonies. I call them families. To me, if you and I lived together with, with your friend and, and, and all, a bunch of people, it'd be a colony, right? But it's not, it's a family, and beaver are very, very territorial. They don't like any other beaver coming in their territory, so they mark it. They let other beaver know, this is where I live. <laughs> now, I've seen lots of scent mounds, and they're little mounds of sticks and mud, and, you know, they don't look like nothing, but you bend down and you smell them, they smell real sweet, you know? This, I saw this, and I thought, what, was some kid messing around? Doesn't that look like fingers crisscrossing? That's a scent mound. I could, I've never seen one like it. I just included this. I think it's so interesting. This is my camera case, and that's a beaver did that. I just love that. See his little handprints there? Next slide. This is so important. This was in Lakewood in Bear Creek. To me, this is gorgeous. Look at that. We were out there, saw a raccoon and a deer. But people complained that the beaver were taking down trees and the city of Lakewood killed them. Can you believe that? Went out there, you know how many trees they had wrapped? One, and it was when with chicken wire and the tree had fallen over. It didn't even work. But that only wrapped one tree. All them people complained, okay? But look what the beaver had created for them. Look at that. Now, next slide, and this is standing on the, the dam looking downstream. This is downstream. Isn't that something? What happens is, is the cities are getting complaints from people that have no knowledge about these animals. And for some reason, the authorities are listening to them and killing the animals. So I call that being managed by the lowest common denominator. Truly, 
Our wildlife are being managed by the lowest common denominator, people that don't know anything about these animals. And rather than the city saying, or the Division <coughs> of Wildlife saying, hey, wait a minute, did you know beaver are keystone species? Because they are. Did you know that 85% of all wildlife at some point in their lives depend on the habitats beaver create? 85%. <coughs> Whoa, that's heavy. Okay, instead of saying that, oh, well, kill them. Woo, I, it's just, it blows my mind. And it, look, there's tons of trees here. Next slide. This is what a lot of our creeks in the West look like because beaver have been removed from them. This is, this is, in, is out of focus, isn't it, sweetie? I'm so sorry. <coughs> There we go. Okay. Instead, next slide, and this is, this is in the shape of the creek, but it's, this is what they should be like. Hope you're up there, baby. Good, okay. This is what they should look like. People remove the beaver from the creeks. And then the water table drops. We gave beaver to an outfitter down near Mancos. He had an eight-foot cut in a stream bank. The beaver raised the water table and the elk came back. Uh, mind blowing, it was beautiful. Next slide. This is what humans do. Now who's the smartest species? Wow, this is in um, Colorado Springs or cement and all their creeks. And you talk, that's a danger. I used to spend all my time wading in the creeks, catching snakes and stuff when I was growing up. You can't wade in that, that's dangerous. Next slide. This is Trout Creek Pass, dam after dam after dam. Chris and I, a couple years ago, went to the state of Washington. In the state of Washington, because of global climate change, they're getting their spring runoff so early that by late spring, early summer, they have no water. Instead of building dams that have cost a billions of dollars to the tax, and a billions, that blew me away, Instead of building dams that have cost of billions of dollars to the taxpayers, they want to relocate beaver to the headwaters of the creeks and rivers and have the beaver be their water storage and flood control engineers. Well, you know something? Their wildlife agency said, but you can't life trap and relocate beaver. And so they had me come to say, oh, yes, you can. It, can you believe that? I mean, I just get blown away all the time. Next slide. And cows. A lot of times people think cows are bad for the land. If you keep them moving, they can be really beneficial. But you have to manage them, not just leave them in one place to overgraze. This land here, next slide, this guy here manages 20,000 acres on the Colorado-Utah border. And all the beaver were trapped from his habitat when one beaver pelt was worth more than an acre of potatoes. Look what it did. Next slide even sheep ranchers. I had to change all my jokes, my sheep rancher jokes. <laughs> he, 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 loves, he loves beaver. He, lo he actually <coughs> likes some coyotes. Isn't that a trip? I love it. Isn't this amazing? Ed Garrison lives over near Montrose. Has a lot of sheep, a lot of land, and does elk hunts. And he wants the beaver to impound the water to make it better, not just for the wildlife, but for his yeah. livestock. Next slide. And this is just, the thing is, is beaver are fabulous for the environment because they are a keystone species. Do you know, even our Colorado Division of Wildlife, now it's Colorado Parks and Wildlife, they talk about habitat restoration all the time. A lot of organizations do habitat, 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 this, bring back the habitat, blah, blah, blah. And in all of the Division of Wildlife's information, not one time do they talk about beaver. If you're talking about habitat and you're not talking about beaver, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's as simple as that. Talking about habitat and not talking about beaver is like building a table with no legs because beaver are a keystone species. They create a healthy aquatic ecosystem to get that foundation, to bring back the water, to create that wildlife habitat. I'm telling you, that's why they're one of the most important wildlife species we have but they also are fabulous, interesting animals with really sweet lives. And that's important to, to, to know too. Because so often people talk about live trapping and relocating beaver. I talk to them across the country and in Canada. 
who talk about them and talk about taking them as they catch them and just dumping them. Oh my gosh. When we relocate kids, oftentimes they'll grab onto the adult and the adult will pull them all around the creek, all around the pond. The adult will dive with that little baby holding onto the back and then pop up and there that baby still is hanging on. So what I try to do is talk about not just how fabulous they are for the environment, but how neat they are. It's sort of like full circle. And we're getting into conflict solutions in a little bit too. Next slide, and I'm sorry I'm about my voice. This guy, his name is Dave Hort, and he was a district wildlife manager for the Colorado Division of Wildlife. This man walks on water. I loved him. He was a hardcore, I mean, wow, you know, hunter and stuff. And, but he realized how important beaver are to the environment and also to Colorado cutthroat and greenback cutthroat trout, which is an endangered species. Now, some of these people, I've had more fun with them than I've ever had with anybody. And Dave Hort, we loaded up Miss Kitty here, put the beaver on the back in panniers in a, a <coughs> nine mile, seven mile, whatever it was, horseback ride up into the Sangre de Cristos to relocate beaver. I had never been on a horse before. I was in such pain. It was, it was, it was so much fun though. Next slide. <coughs> Here we are putting it into the water, the whole family. He retired, I'm so sorry. Now we have a lot of people that, you know, uh, landowners that want beaver and the Division of Wildlife won't give us permission because they say, why do you want to take a problem one place and make it a problem someplace else? Mind boggling, it's mind boggling. Next slide. Boreal toads, another endangered animal. Beaver are up, boreal toads will lay their <laughs> eggs in the shallows in the warm shallows of beaver ponds. Okay, next slide. And some people just want beaver because they like the animals. I don't know of another wild animal that I would want a child to be so close to. Mr. Kellogg that lives over uh, west of Boulder. Next slide. And then we talk about beaver and commas conflict solutions. When I first started live trapping, Live trapping and relocating beaver is like almost like a 24-7 job. I mean, because we have to feed them, we have to water them, we have to care for them, make sure they're cool, have to make sure they're cool for sure. And for the first seven years, we didn't charge for it. Now I charge the city of Aurora. We sign a contract, the whole nine yards. I have to get a million dollars worth of insurance. Pisses me off. Because the whole thing is is I did it for 23 years and never had that million dollars of insurance. So yeah, we, we charge. I don't make anything from it. It all goes to Wildlife 2000 to allow me to travel and to do our uh, information and stuff like that. And anyway, but even though we make money from doing it, my whole goal is, is to talk you out of it. I will do everything I can to talk you out of having those beaver moved. And one of the ways is, is the first thing I say, well, what are the beaver doing you don't like? And usually it's something simple like taking down trees, okay? One of the things that people need to realize is in the development is to plan for the wildlife. Wildlife live here too. Colorado is their home too. So when you plan a development or a home or whatever, plan with the wildlife in mind, then they will never become a problem. I believe that there is no such thing as nuisance wildlife, only uninformed and irresponsible people. Maybe that's a little harsh, but that's your hairdresser talking, sweetie. <laughs> One of the things is when they do developments is plan for the animals. This is, now this is heartbreaking. Next slide. This is the San Miguel River in Telluride. They just choke the crap out of that river. Rivers are not supposed to be straight. They're, I'm a big old girl now. They're supposed to be curvy like me. They're supposed to meander, slow down, get that water touching everything, man. Next slide. Get kids involved. Identify and scat, planting trees. One of the things is, is there is no environmental education in the schools anymore. People have no connection to the earth that actually give them life. You get kids out and then they start and get and cleaning up trash and stuff like that. They start feeling an ownership that this is mine. Don't throw your trash out and teach them to be respectful. When you're outside, you're really in someone else's home. Something else lives there. And if you're real quiet, you might see it. Next slide. And wrap trees. 
What we do now is we use four by four inch wire mesh. We leave about, this is kind of the way we used to do it. We leave a foot between the tree and the wire to give the tree room to grow. And if you have a business or something and you do this, you put up signage advertising what you're doing. People love you for it, man. They love you for it because you're coexisting with the wildlife. And then you're teaching other people how to do it. Next slide. <clears throat> this is so funny. <coughs> this, okay, years ago, they built, I don't know if you're all familiar with Denver, but they built Elitch as an amusement park right down by the Platte River in a riparian area. Just could not believe my eyes. Okay, and there was a beaver lodge there and they destroyed it. Planted trees, the beaver took them down. They did, I told them to wrap the trees, they didn't wrap them, so shut up. You know, and the thing is, is I got a call from, from the Denver Parks and Recreation. <laughs> Elitches is on right across from Denver Parks and Recreation, and the beaver moved over to this sandbar. And kids were going down and throwing rocks at them. So Denver Park called me. They said, you, could you please come move these beaver? Kids are going to hurt them. And I said, oh, my God. I said, well, I can't. It's December. Okay? I said, supplementary feed them. I said, I'll bring some limbs down. They said, we'll do it. And they did. They brought them limbs, but the beaver didn't do nothing. So I heard the temperature was going to drop 14 degrees below zero. I said, well, let me put up a little lean-to. They said, oh, we'll do something. They built in this condo. <laughs> a little timeout place. Beaver were, were using it. Okay? So then, come May, Chatfield was going to let the water out of Chatfield Reservoir. Holy cow. I called Denver Parks. I said, what are we going to do, man? They said, next slide, we'll build them a houseboat. <laughs> okay, and oh, and, and you, know, you know the one with, with, with the hay? This was really cool. I was so excited when I saw that. I was jumping up and down. I was wahooing, and I was up on 15th Street Bridge, and it was 15th Street Bridge is right up here. And I'm looking down, and there was these two women walking down the bridge, and I was so happy. I said, look, look what Denver Parks did. Oh, my God, can you believe that? And she looks at that. It was in December, right? She goes, is that a manger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. Come June, we caught the beaver. This was the deputy director of the time, and we put the beaver family, the whole family, right outside of Rocky Mountain National Park at McGregor Ranch. Okay, so the thing is, is when somebody has a problem with these animals, if they have to be moved, you kind of have to bide your time to make it good for them. Okay, you just don't do it because somebody's got a problem, with, because somebody's got an issue, because they don't know what they're talking about anyway. So you got to educate them, and you said, wait, we got to make it good, for, it's got to be good for you, it's got to be good for the animals too, sweetie, you know, and so that's what you do. We fixed it until they could be safely moved, until it was good for them too. Next slide. Oh, the days of glory when I was a skinny broad. Um, <laughs> beaver, you know, people will say, like to supplementary feed, because sometimes to buy time about moving animals, will supplementary feed them so they won't take down the trees. Beaver, take it. Real simple, real straightforward. But a lot of times people say, well, just like give them wood or something like that. Beaver eat the green living layer between the bark and the tree. And they eat the leaves and stuff like that. This is about a mile from where I live. Next slide. Oh, this is so good. This is Long's Peak Inn. Isn't that gorgeous? Up in Rocky Mountain National Park, right outside of Estes Park. And Highway 7 goes across in front of it. Next slide. And the beaver had plugged it up. A couple of years before, the highway, Colorado Department of Transportation killed the animals. And the people were really angry. Made a big stink about it. So they did it this time again. They tried to jury rig this pipe in there. Didn't work, you can see. And they were real concerned that they were gonna flood the road, the road's gonna break or something, and cars are gonna get all messed up. So in 1999, I went to the Colorado Department of Transportation. I said, let me put in a flow device. Brought my friend out from, from Vermont. His name is Skip Lyle. He worked with the Penobscot Indian Nation for 12 years and developed a flow device that works. Okay, next slide. Called a beaver deceiver. 
Notice this arm right here coming out. This is a really narrow passageway. If you come up with a solution for a wildlife conflict, you have to make it good for the animals too. It's just being ethical. And this is good for the animals too because this is so narrow that they can't take food in their mouths to plug up the culvert, but it's just wide enough that they can go through here, go through the culvert to the other side, not have to go over the road and get hit by a car. Isn't that something? This flow device has been there since 1999. One of the drawbacks for flow devices is, well, you got to clean them all the time. Since 1999, I have cleaned that flow device maybe twice. To, to, to about 10 minutes. Okay, didn't really even need to be cleaned. Um, they work. If somebody puts in a flow device and it doesn't work, they work, they just didn't do it right. It's as simple as that. We use top quality material. We use four gauge, which is really thick, six by six inch wire mesh. You cannot buy this stuff at Hugh M. Woods or Home Depot. Mm -hmm. You have to go to a, a place that builds const uh, has construction <coughs> materials. They come in panels eight foot by 20 foot long. We use pressure treated posts eight foot long, eight inches wide in diameter, I should say, and we use braces. These flow devices work. <laughs> Last year, we had some real high waters and a root ball of a tree came down and smashed in the side of it. It looks like hell, but it's still working. You know, I'd like, got to get in there and fix it up, but it's still working. Next slide. This is Skip Lyle. <coughs> he, we put this, this is McGraw Ranch. This was also the second day of our conference. We did a conference in Rocky Mountain National Park called um, Beaver, and, Beaver and Common Sense Conflict Solutions. This flow device here, it's still a beaver deceiver. You see how it looks different? So often humans, when they do something, they make it cookie cutter. But that's not, that's not nature. Each flow device looks a little different because each side is different. Okay? This one is beautiful. There was a double culvert here. This ranch was donated to Rocky Mountain National Park and they were opening it up as a wildlife uh, educational center. But Rocky Mountain National Park was spending thousands and thousands of dollars cleaning this culvert out every year. So I asked them, let's put in this flow device. This beaver deceiver has been there since 1999. I've never cleaned it. Now, there's, beaver, there's a beaver dam here. I'm still using slides. I need to go to a, oh God, I'm so old fashioned. If anybody could help me, I'd love that, you know, to get in the, <coughs> do a computer or stuff like that because I've got a lot of new pictures, but I just, I just don't know how, I'm a hairdresser. You know, I can cut, I can cut your hair real good, but. Um, there's beaver all around here. Sometimes this is a complete pond and this flow device is still working, never been cleaned. If you go across the road, next slide. This is what's across the road. Beaver dam after beaver dam after beaver dam. You can just see the trout in here. Isn't that something? <coughs> what our flow devices do is keep the animals in the habitat where they belong and they solve the problem. So you don't have a conflict and the beaver are not causing a problem. You can, we can coexist with them. Next slide. Skip sometimes puts decks on them. So you can use these as wildlife observation or fly fishing. So often when people do flow devices, and a lot of times they do it half-heartedly, it looks like hell. You drive by, it looks like somebody dumped their garbage and trash in, into the pond or the creek. When Skip does it, and the way he taught me, is you make it look good. You've got to make it look good because the thing is, is we're, we're, we're in a battle here. We're in a battle for our wildlife. And somebody's not gonna, if they have a nice home, they don't wanna put something in their yard or in their property that looks shabby. And so you make it look good and you know, make them feel good about it. It's better to wear a white hat than a black hat. Um, they're more likely to go that way. Next slide. This is a filter. 
Next slide. This was eight feet in diameter. This was over near Durango. The whole point of this, we put two double wall polyethylene pipes in, all right? Um, this filter goes on the end of the pipes. The water's coming through here and then coming out here underneath the culvert. Go to the next slide, Chris, then we're going to go back, all right? I'm sorry, go forward again. Okay, this here where you put the pipes, that dictates the water level back here. Once this fills up, it will get not get past the, the end of these pipes. Okay, now go back, Chris. What this does is this filter is large <coughs> enough. The water's coming through these pipes. The filter is large enough that the beaver don't hear the water going into it. They don't feel it, so they don't mess around with it. If they build a dam in front of this double this other wall, this other fence here, it won't do them any good because the water's going through the culvert from back here. It's almost like that magic trick, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. You know? And they work. Next slide. Keep going. They come in all shapes and sizes. So regardless of where you are, you can build it to fit your situation. As long as you use four, and I'm serious, four gauge wire mesh, six by six inch. My book, it's available, great price, $10, goes step by step on how to build them. And my phone number's in there if you have any questions. Next slide. <coughs> you can know about, isn't that something? Look at that, a little facey facey. Um, you can know about beaver, like they live in the wild about 10 to 12 years. All right, but I had a friend that had a beaver lived 18 years. Okay, um, like I said, they mate January, February. They have their babies in May. Did you know they mate belly to belly? Isn't that romantic? Underneath water, hold your breath. Okay, um, but, but you can't forget that each beaver is different from the other one. They're as individual from each other as we are from each other. People want to cubbyhole everything, but you can't do that because they're all different, okay? And this was like back in 1986. Look at that horrible hair. I would love to go back in time and change that. Next slide. I'm still doing it, still finding people in places that want beaver. Is that the softest looking thing you've ever seen? So you have never been attacked? I have been bit one time. Now I'm real fast, but, but the thing is, is when we used to relocate beaver and we used to carry them in our arms to the place we were going to relocate them, I didn't have any cages and I didn't have any air conditioning in my car. We just have to roll down the window. Uh, the beaver got real warm. And when we were carrying him to the place we were going to relocate them, he heard the water and wanted down and he bit my hand. So that real, and, and I believe that if you're messing around with wildlife and you get bit, that's life its own self. Don't complain about it. You know, um, it's, just, it's just not that big of a deal to me. And I'm a hairdresser and it's not that big of a deal to me. And the thing is, is being bit by a beaver, their mouths are so clean um, that I just, I've never worried about it. The other disease they get, by the way, that I want to talk a little bit about is tularemia. Okay, tularemia, if you get it, it comes in flu-like symptoms <coughs> right, and unhealing lesions. And there's two kinds of tularemia. There's the kind that beaver get in an aquatic ecosystem, and then there's the kind that you get in the plains, like rabbits get. They call it rabbit fever, okay? It's very contagious, okay? You get it. There was a trapper that was trapping muskrat, and as he was skinning them, he was wiping his brow and got unhealing lesions across his brow. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Um, then there was a woman who went to a meat market and was buying rabbit, and had pricked herself in the arm, this was in the 40s, pricked herself in the arm with a hat pin, put her arm up on a counter, and got tularemia. I've talked to a scientist about tularemia that developed actually a vaccine for it. He said if you get tularemia, you go to the doctor, they'll usually give you tetracycline. Ten days after you stop taking the tetracycline, the tularemia will return. The cure for tularemia is streptomycin. I just love stuff like that. I love it, love it, love it. Picked up a big beaver. I was doing this woman's hair. Check it out. Doing this woman's hair, and I got this call. This beaver had tularemia in Bear Creek. I left the shop. I said, honey, you've got to understand. I, 
got to get this beaver. And I went to Bear Creek. This beaver was enormous. And I had this garbage bag with me, and I just laid it on my arms, picked up this beaver, took it to the Division of Wildlife. I said, what can we do? They sent it to CSU as the worst case of tularemia they'd ever seen. You know the funny thing is? Is none of the other beaver died in Bear Creek? Because I live right by there. We found no more dead beaver. So the whole thing with tularemia, people use that as this thing, oh, you've got to kill all the beaver because they've got, oh, shut up. You know, you really don't. Um, it's something that's in these ecosystems, these creeks and rivers. It's natural. They really don't know what triggers it, okay? But it's just, it's just something, it's a natural thing. Notice, I do not call them drainages. I hate that word. <laughs> Drainage means it drains from point A to point B. There's nothing in between. It's divorcing us from the fact that these creeks and rivers are alive with life. If you view them as a drainage, you don't really care. It's a drainage, who cares? But it's a creek, it's a river, it's alive. You know, we're doing that in Denver. We're building bicycle paths. We're choking out the creeks and stuff. We gotta cherish these places, let them live, let them move in this magical dance of nature. And it's like with the animals. All this wildlife we have, People think they can pick and choose which animals they like, which animals they don't like. When it's this magical dance of nature, when all the animals have a role to fill, we can't pick and choose. Because if we continue to do that, the whole circle is going to collapse in and on itself. It truly is this magical, wondrous dance of nature that we should sit back and watch and enjoy and watch it move and watch it dance and enrich our lives. So all animals have roles to fill. It's just that beaver are cuter and they're just, you know. Anyway, okay, next slide and that, that's it. Thank you so much for coming. If you have any questions at all, I'm here. Yes, sir. Well, they over time, will they move to other areas if they They can. Take over? Yeah. They eat all their vegetation? That they're... They do yeah. and they will move and then they'll come back. It's like... They'll move it. It's ebbing and flowing and coming back. And yeah, it, I mean, that's just so cool, you know? Yeah. And, and, and when they, I, where were, I was in the mountains someplace. But what, what's, is it Mount Elbert? And I went swimming in a beaver pond with no clothes on. That was really <laughs> fun. But, but the thing is, is there, there were no beaver there. And the dam, the, the dam had been there for about five years. So the dam was holding. That's so cool. But then another story. Th this was this. Uh, if this man would have been in front of me, God help him. Uh, he lived over near Dillon, and he called and he wanted me to move some beaver, right? And his story was, the beaver were taking down his trees. Give me a break, okay? I said, well, you got to wrap your trees. Well, I've got too many trees. Well, then what do you care if the beaver take a few? Oh my gracious. Anyway, I said, did you know? that if you get rid of them beaver, you're gonna lose that dam you like, you're gonna lose the water table you like. And he said to me, me, he said, well, if I start to lose the dam, I'll just call you, you can relocate some more beaver up here, then you could, oh, honey, mm. Yeah, woohoo. Anyway, th those are the kind of calls I get. People are crazy. I know I didn't cover everything, there must be something. Yes, sir. The handling of the beaver. Uh -huh. <clears throat> didn't they, they, the beavers obviously didn't seem to have any problem with being handled. Yeah, and did their handling have any effect on the beavers later no. on? No, that's the other thing. That's what's so cool. Oh, I love this. Did you know when you when you the Division of Wildlife said well, you can't imprint them. You you know you're going to imprint yourself on them. Oh, come on. A beaver because they're just not aggressive. Okay, you can handle them. I've crawled in a cage body to body with a big old beaver, trying to get the kid out of the back because it got real cold at my house and I wanted to bring him in the house. I was fine with it, okay? But once you turn those beaver loose, they're gone. You can't go, and here they come. You're not gonna imprint them. People tell you that, so, so you don't mess with nothing. Oh, you're gonna make friend. oh, maybe other animals that, I, I don't know of any other animal that, animals that, that do that though but beaver do not do not, not imprint on you just because they're not aggressive and try to bite you does not mean that you're making a pet out of them because once you turn them loose they are gone 
this is such a good story. I got a call from this woman who lived near Parker, on the other side of Parker, and she got a call. Oh, this was maddening. This guy downstream was saying that she had to get rid of her beaver because the beaver were taking the water. Oh, give me a break. And so the, she, they were causing pressure on her, and we had to, she wanted me to move the beaver. So when I got out there, I set five traps. She had five beaver. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're, we're good trappers. We should have got five beaver, at least four, and come back, get them all in two nights. I caught one beaver. <coughs> I thought, whoa. Had the beaver in the trap and took it out of the water, and the beaver turned. There was a hole in his side, a hole that I could stick my fingers in. There were no more beaver. Either coyotes or dogs killed his family. Okay? Freak out, took the beaver home, and I treated the beaver with salve and with hydrogen peroxide. Okay? Had him for about seven, eight days. Was starting to heal. Didn't want to keep him any longer because they, they don't like it. I don't like it. It's, it's probably harder on me than it is on them. We, Chris and I took it to the sheep rancher's land. Okay? We took it to a nice private little pond. The injury was healing. And I hadn't been really friendly with this beaver. You know, I talked to it, assured it that it's going to be okay. You always tell them that it's going to be okay, baby. They, they feel it. Okay? So we got it down to this pond, and I wanted to stand on one side of the pond and then have Chris and him, um, Ed, release it, and I was going to take pictures. So they release it, and the beaver was really happy to be free. He went and he started chewing on some bushes, swam, smelled some stuff, dove under the water, came up, and came over to me. Got out of the water, walked up to me, held up his hands, and looked at me. And I started crying. And I said, you are the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I kneeled down and I patted him. And then he got back in the water and he swam off. Wow, you know. It, it, that, was, that, that touches me. So you don't imprint them, but, but they're, there's just something special about them. If you let them be that special with you. Thank you. That rather than management, see, you talk about management, and I talk about management, and you think they talk about management, it means the same thing, it doesn't. Right. They're talking about hunting, fishing, trapping as a tradition. Okay. We're talking about management, of keeping animals in a habitat and have them sustained, realizing that the population is going to grow and drop but the highs and lows are going to be much smaller. They're not going to be so exaggerated as they would if they would kill trap them, okay, which means that drops, you lose your habitat and stuff. So, so, so it, it's not, it, the controversy is we've got people promoting the tradition of honey fishing trapping, and we're talking about habitat restoration, mm -hmm. okay, and educating people that, that when beaver take down trees, that that's cool because that's what they're supposed to do. And that in fact, a lot of the trees benefit from the pruning action of their teeth. But humans have tunnel vision. What mm -hmm. they see in front of them is th they think that that's all that there's gonna be. You have to it's expand. Just be right, and they also have the horrible golf course complex, which they move from the city to the mountains, and they want a tree here, a bush here, flowers here, and they don't want it to change. Mm -hmm. They want it to stay the same. The only thing constant in nature is change. For a habitat to be healthy, vital, and alive, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. But they have to be taught that because no one's ever told them that. So then they call with an issue beaver taking... Oh, that, God, remember that. They call with an issue beaver taking down trees, and instead of saying, but did you know, the Division of Wildlife says, well, shoot them. Mm -hmm. 